it's a little bit of a, of a new topic in education that has been surfacing over the last three years. And I thought that this was a great venue to come in and talk a little bit about these new ideas, this new research that's been going on, this new trend in education, and, and to see if there's a place for it in welding education, which I, I firmly believe that there is. So before I start, let me introduce myself. My name is David Hernandez. I'm the Director of Educational Development for the American Welding Society. And I wanted to start this presentation with a little warning. Uh, Mr. Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, said, uh, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. Um, and I am a person who is often wrong but I am prepared to do that. So this is a presentation where, when I've spoken about this in the past, there's been some disagreement in the room, and I encourage that. This presentation's purpose is to encourage you to think about education a little bit differently. It's to encourage discussion. It's to share some new ideas, some new research. Um, I am not saying that this is the best way to do things. I'm just saying it's a new way in which people are doing things. Uh, the other thing is this. Uh, there's a zero correlation between how good uh, or how, how being the best speaker and having the best ideas. Um, my ideas are just my ideas. Okay, and don't take any more value in these ideas because I'm up here speaking and you're there listening. Uh, again, this is really just to spur some discussion between us, between the group, and, and to see if maybe we can find some best practices in education. One of the key things that we talked about yesterday uh, in my presentation and some of the other presentations was this concept of motivating students. One of my favorite quotes when it comes to motivating students says, there are three things to emphasize in teaching. The first is motivation, the second is motivation, and the third, and you guessed it, is motivation. There's a lot of research done over the last 40 years in, in, in what motivates people. And a lot of it comes out of the business world. A lot of it comes out of the marketing world, trying to figure out how we can motivate people to purchase our products. A lot of that motivation has been ignored in educational circles because it's not been done specifically in a classroom. But there's a lot of value in this research. I wanted to share one study uh, in particular that was done uh, about 30 years ago. Okay? It's been replicated many, many times since, and it's often been ignored. The study was simple. They took a group of lawyers, established lawyers who all had private firms or worked in private firms. And they split them in half. They put them in two groups. Okay? They said to the first group, you are going to litigate for a group of people, but you're going to do it pro bono. Okay? We're going to send you to these low income areas. You're going to go re uh, uh, represent these individuals who cannot afford legal help, and you'll do it completely without charge. Okay? Then they went to the second group of lawyers, and they said, okay, you are going to go to this other low income area and you're going to represent a different group of people. But you will charge them between $10 and $20 an hour. Now most of these lawyers are making two, three, four hundred dollars an hour. Okay, so it's a significant reduction in what they're doing, but they're still getting paid. What do you think happened? Which group was happier? Which group was more motivated to do their work? Which group performed better in the courtroom? Well, logic would say it's the group that got paid. You know, because, I mean, that's why we do things. How many people go to work because, uh, you know, they like getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning? You know, I mean, we, we get paid because it gives us money, and that's how we pay for our house and our cars and going out and, and, and all the expensive juries we have to pay our, give our wives when we mess up. You know, it's, it's just it's, it's what we do. It's how our society functions. It's how the business world functions. But the study showed something completely different. When you did a side-by-side -side comparison of the two groups, the group that was getting paid was generally very unhappy. They didn't want to do the work. They performed poor. Whereas the group that was doing it pro bono showed high levels of motivation, high levels of excitement. When the psychologists completed the study, they did a bunch of questionnaires and interviews, 
And this is what they found. They said that the individuals that were getting paid the 10 to $20 could not psychologically separate what they were actually getting paid versus what they should have been getting paid. And so to them, it was an economic transaction. It was simply a A is greater than B. My time is worth more than 10 to $20. This is an injustice that I am doing this at this rate. The group that wasn't getting paid at all was very happy because they were helping other people. It made them feel good about themselves. Okay? It, it, it made them realize that there was a value to what they were doing. The work itself was the reward and not the money. Now, this flies in, in the face of everything we, we do in business now, which there's a great book written by Daniel Pink. If you guys have never had a chance to uh, take a look at any of his presentations or, or read any of his books, where he talks about motivation. And, and one of the things that he writes in his book is that everything we do in business today flies in the face of 50 years of motivation research. Everything we do is based on these half-ass ideas that have been created by CEOs on how businesses need to be run, but it flies in the face of how people are actually motivated. Okay, there's a great problem that he talks about where it's the candle problem. He talks about, it, you know, there's a, you walk into a room, there's a box of tacks, you know, there's a, a, a candle and a, 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 a booklet of matches. And people are told when they go into the room, okay, you need to figure out how you can get that candle to stick to that wall and not drip any wax on the floor. So people, you know, fumble around and they do things and they try all these, they try to tack the candle onto there with the tacks and the tacks aren't long enough. They tried to build little things and eventually they figure something out. They figure that if you just take the tacks out of the box, you can tack the box to the wall. Put the candle on top, you now have a candle holder. They run this experiment hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of times in different universities, and they do, often do it in two groups. One group, they tell, look, the fastest five times, get $20. The other group says, we're just trying to see who has the fastest time. The group who has the motivation for money, oftentimes takes several minutes longer to figure out the problem than the other group. The science of motivation has been ignored. And it's been ignored in schools. The factory setting that we have in the average classroom today implements a lot of the same business motivation we see in the business world. Think about it. In business, if you do well, you get a promotion. You get a bonus. You get some sort of incentive. In school, if you do well, you get the carrot, the A. If you do poorly, you get to stick. This is the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Both of those studies and countless other studies have shown the same thing. Extrinsic motivation, which is motivation from outside the individual, it's a bonus, it's money, it's a grade, is a much poorer motivator than intrinsic motivation. We saw the same example with the lawyers. The lawyer group that was doing it for the money was generally very unhappy. But the group that was doing it because it was good to do it, because it, you were helping other people, because their work itself within themselves was the reward, was exponentially more happy, did exponentially better work. Since the 1970s, countless studies have shown in education that intrinsic motivation produces better achievement than extrinsic motivation. Grades are not an effective motivator for students. I always think back of when I was in school. You know, how, think about when you were back in school. How effective was the idea of, oh, well, you're going to get a C if you don't do this as a, as a means for you to do your homework? Were you happy doing your homework? Did you want to do your homework? Or did you just do it just to avoid the, the, the consequences? So the question is why? Why are we still trying to stick a square peg in a round hole? Um, there's a great book 
that I read not too long ago called Growing Up Digital, uh, in which the author talks about Generation Z, this new generation of, of students uh, that have been around for the last uh, 10 years or so. And he says that they're using technology in ways that makes them smarter. They think differently from previous generations. And he basically says their brains are wired differently. Remember we showed this chart yesterday. For those of you that weren't here uh, or, or part of the presentation yesterday, I'll go over it very briefly. Um, this is a chart taken uh, where they measure a student's performance across a country, students' performances across a country in science education at four different stages, or three different stages, in fourth grade, eighth grade, and twelfth grade. They split the twelfth grade in two into general and to advanced students. And they measure the results of the United States versus other countries. In fourth grade, notice the number of countries that are lower than the United States in blue. In red, you have the countries that are equivalent to the United States. And green, you have countries that are higher scoring than the United States. It's a very low number. In fourth grade, we are leading the world in science education. We are producing scientifically literate students. But by the time you get into 12th grade, that's completely reversed. We are now behind almost every single country in the world. Another study shows measuring third and fifth graders shows the same results. That in third and fourth grade, we are more advanced in several subjects, including math and science, than other countries around the world. But by the time they hit 15 years old, we are worse. Does anyone want to argue that this is not an issue of motivation with our students? Now, there are other contributing factors that we talked about yesterday. A lack of science teachers, a lack of, lack of math teachers at the higher levels. But there's also a greater epidemic going on here, an epidemic where we are not motivating our students effectively. And it all comes down to this very simple idea. Motivation drives engagement. Motivation drives engagement. If you take nothing out of this presentation, remember those words. Motivation drives engagement. Think about a hobby that you enjoy doing. Okay, whether it's fixing your car, or fishing, or playing with your dog outside. When you're doing that, you're choosing to, doing that, to do that. You don't have to do that. And when you're doing it, you want to do it. And when you want to do it, you're there in the present. I'm not sitting there fishing, thinking about all the work I have to do. I'm not sitting there fishing, thinking about how I want, I want to be in bed right now, sleeping. I'm sitting there fishing in the moment, enjoying it. I am engaged because I'm motivated to be there. There was a great study done by MIT uh, in conjunction with um, the One Laptop Per Child project. Uh, I read about this um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, they presented the results, I think, in October. Um, and I was fascinated when I read this study. Apparently, the, the One Laptop Per Child organization dropped a bunch of boxes in a small Ethiopian village. OK? It's, it's, a, it's in a rural area by Crater Lake, in Ethiopia, they dropped the boxes off in the middle of the village, and they walked away. Inside of these boxes were these tablets, these tablet computers. Okay, They had been preloaded with all sorts of educational software, okay? uh, games, videos, books, songs, everything we can preload with digital media, they put it in there. They loaded it up, they dropped the boxes off, they walked away, and they monitored what happened. Four minutes into the experiment, a child had opened the box and powered up the machine. Pulled out the tablet, powered it up. Five days later, there were 20 tablets. The average child in the village was using 47 apps per day. 14 days into the study, the kids were singing the ABC song. Five months in, the kids had figured out a way to hack the Android operating system 
to remove the security features that the people at, the, uh, at MIT had placed into, the, into it so that they can do things like use the camera and change the background and move and download more apps and do things like that. And that's where we are now. The whole purpose of the experiment is to try to figure out whether those kids can teach themselves to read without a teacher. Okay, it's, it's what's called, um, it, it, it's, it's the idea of less invasive education. It's, it's, it's trying to find whether people have the capacity to educate themselves outside of a classroom. But when I read the study, the first thing came to me was, those kids didn't have to do any homework. They weren't forced to do any of this. They weren't even told to do any of this. They dropped laptops off in a village, or, or tablets in a village, and they just walked away. When you look at the report, one of the great parts of it, he talks about the fact that they hacked the system, they figured out how to do all these different things, and the fact that they worked around it was clear of a kind of creativity, a kind of uh, inquiry, a kind of discovery that we think is essential to learning. See, to them it wasn't about learning how to do something. It wasn't learning how to use this tablet. They didn't go to a classroom to do it. To them it was about discovery, which is something we talked about a lot yesterday. Here's a picture from part of the study. That's what brings me to gamification. Gamification is the idea that we're going to integrate game mechanics into non-games. Okay? I promise you this is real. I'm not making any of this up. And this again is something that's being driven by business. This is not something that originated in education. It's something that originated in business and marketing. A recent study st said that by 2015, 70% of worldwide businesses will have integrated gamification into their processes with their customers. 70% in the next three years. Psychologists have figured out that there's a certain part of our brain in the digital world that responds extremely well to gamification. Take the example of Farmville. How many people have heard of Farmville? I unfortunately have. Okay, Farmville, for those of you that are, not, that are not aware of it, is a game in which you have to tend to a digital farm. And when I mean tend to a digital farm, I mean in 15 minutes I have to go back to my Farmville to harvest my crops and plant more seeds. And often people have to go back throughout the day to the game to do the same practice. And the more seeds that they plant, the more money they get, and the more other things they could buy for their farm. And so they literally spend the entire time on the game doing digital chores. Okay, that's the whole, that's the whole game right there. Right now, 28 million people log into Farmville more than once a day. 28 million people play this every day. That's larger than the populations of Fiji, Puerto Rico, Panama, Sweden, and Portugal put together, by the way. What's even more interesting is this. Today, as of this date, there are 80 million users of Farmville, which makes it the 17th largest country in the world. So I want to ask this question. How many of you, and I want to see you raise your hands, how many of you play games every single day? Raise it high. Three people? Four? Four? I learned this word recently. It's malarkey. Really, it should be looking like this. Because every single person in this room plays games every single day. You just don't know it. Because the business world has gotten so good at hiding it. For example, how many people here have a club card? Belong to Costco, or to PetSmart, or to Regal, or have some sort of reward card for a business? 
that's a gamification where you build a loyalty scheme into a game. Countless amount of research has shown that people will go back to the same spot just to get those points. I cannot go to a restaurant in Miami without being handed a, here, if you get 10 sandwiches here, you get one free. It's become the norm. How many of you guys have a credit card that gives you points? It's the same concept. How many of you drink Coca-Cola and notice that under each cap, there's a unique code that if you go online, you can punch into your account and get points and use those points to get free stuff. I just discovered this app that allows me to track my American Airlines miles. I check it once a day. I don't fly every day. <laughs> Why? Because I like to see that little bar fill up and tell me where I am. How many people have heard of Foursquare? No one? Foursquare is an app on your phone. And what you do is it, it plays off of the GPS feature on your phone. And you check into locations. So right now, I'm in here. I check in. I check in at Fabtech. It lets people know through my social media, David just checked in at Fabtech. Okay? It's a little ridiculous, in my opinion. I never use it. But people love it. Because the more you check in in a location, the more points you get at that location. And eventually, you can become the mayor of that location. And let me tell you, I can't tell you how excited people become when they become the mayor of a location. Foursquare has added a new element to this, a new layer to it now, where they allow businesses to offer digital coupons to people who become the mayor, to people who check in. So now there's a different level of incentive. Now it's, just not, not let me just, now it's more than just let me check in so that I can show people where I am. Now it's let me check in and check if there's any coupons for shopping here. Oftentimes, you can go to Starbucks, check in on Foursquare, and see, hey, a dollar off your next cup of coffee. How many people have ever go to a sale? See, hey, there's a sale online. Amazon does this to me every day with that golden box sale. Now we're getting to Thanksgiving. Why is the day after Thanksgiving the busiest shopping holiday in America? Because that's where all the sales are. A sale is nothing but a gamified process. Okay, it uses what's called an appointment dynamic. It's a very simple game, you see. In order to win the game, all you have to do is show up. And when you show up, you win a prize, and that prize is X discount or X benefit. Weight Watchers. Charles Barkley is doing Weight Watchers. Why does Weight Watchers have a point system? Why don't they just count calories? That's what they're basically doing. Why is it built into a point system? Because they found that if they put a point system on it, people will play the game. People want to save up their points and use their points and see how many points they could use up and save up. Like I said, Amazon does this to me every day, the golden box. I got to buy a new shaver, why? Because it's there, it's a discount. And it's only available for X amount of time. QVC used to do this on TV all the time. Now the internet stores are doing it. We're having a flash sale, 50 minutes only. Buy this new shaver. You don't shave your head, it's okay, but you need it. Why? Because it's discounted, 50%. 50% from what? From whatever number I just gave you. Netflix, how many people use Netflix? Brilliant gamification. Can anyone tell me what the game in Netflix is? There's two. Two different games that they use. One is the rating system. They use rating systems and sharing your ratings with other people and allowing, and your friends, and your friends to share their ratings. And now it's helping you choose better movies, but it's also encouraging your friends to watch certain movies and they're encouraging you to watch certain movies. There's also a second one that started right when the, when the business took off. And one of the reasons why Netflix has grown as much as it has. Can anyone tell me what it is? It's a very simple game. It's very easy. Every Netflix subscriber can give you a code to anyone else to give them a free month of Netflix. It's a simple game. I'm giving you a code. In order to play the game, all you have to do is enter it into your computer and you win. What's your prize? One month of Netflix. 
And that is what caused Netflix to grow at such a fast rate and essentially put video stores out of business. Fantasy football. How many people in here play fantasy football? Don't lie. Don't lie, it's okay, I play too. The NFL has attributed multiple times their growth over the last 10 years in viewership, in merchandising, to fantasy football. I grew up in a house, my dad played college football. I played football in high school. Uh, I grew up in a house where, where it's a temple to football. You know? and, and so to me, Sundays are sacred because that is the day of football. You know, we, uh, the first game of every year, we sacrifice a pig to the football gods. I mean, it's, it's, we take this seriously. I watch every game on, on, on Sunday. I don't get up from that couch. You know, I, I stick a catheter in and I just sit there. <laughs> and yet, my entire life, I've been like this. And yet, when I started playing fantasy football, I find myself more engaged in those games it was no longer me sitting back, drinking a beer, eating some barbecue, peeing through a tube. Now it was, I was engaged. I was sitting at the edge of my seat. I wanted that guy right there who was not on my team, who two weeks ago I didn't know who he was, to score a touchdown. I needed him to because it was going to give me points and it was going to help me win a digital game that really didn't matter for anything in a world that doesn't exist. You're starting to see the same concept bleed itself into education. Why did Lincoln Electric decide to purchase a company that developed VR technology to build a virtual welder? Why is Miller doing the same thing? Why is Fronius internationally doing the same thing? Why are there virtual welders? It's simple. It engages people. Look at the trailer. Look at how many students go through the AWS trailer every time it's somewhere. You know what the most popular spot for that trailer is every year? FAA. Okay, they, they, they get 50,000 kids, I'm sorry, the FFA, sorry. Future Farmers of America, I'm sorry, I totally screwed that up. Um, they get about 50,000 kids going through that trailer. Most of them are not welders. Most of them are not gonna be welders. And yet every kid that walks out of there thinks to themselves, wow, that was great. I had fun welding, maybe. Because it engages them on a different level. Nintendo figured this out a few years ago. See, with the advent of PlayStation and the Xbox, Nintendo had seen its sales dropping dramatically. And so when they developed the Wii, they realized, look, there is an untapped market out there. All these adults are gamers, and they don't even know it. Their brains work essentially the same as their students. And so they developed a system that was going to be, that's going to be exciting for not just kids to play, but for adults to play also. And that's what resurrected the company. World of Warcraft. I talk about this a lot. This is a game where you actually have to pay $15 a month to play it, okay? It has something, um, it has something like 28 million subscribers worldwide. It's the most popular MMORPG, massive multiplayer online role-playing game. What's fascinating about World of Warcraft is this, though. This is a breakdown of the average age of a World of Warcraft player. The largest segments are 23 to 28 and 18 to 22 year olds. The second largest segment is, eight, is, is 12 to 17 with the third right after that one at 19% being 29 to 35. If you look at 18 to 35 year old, you're talking about almost three fourths of all the players. This kind of goes in the face of what we think about gaming, of what we think about games. This is my favorite example about it. May 22nd, 2010 was the uh, anniversary of Pac-Man. So Google, doing what Google does, decided it was going to create a doodle on its homepage where it was an actual Pac-Man game with the, with the Google logo built inside. Okay? This was up 
on the Google website for 48 hours. Okay, they left it up there for 48 hours. In those 48 hours, America lost 4.8 million hours of productivity during work time. Okay, that is the equivalent of 1% of China's GDP in a 48 hour period because Google decided they were gonna put a Pac-Man game on your search engine during work hours. MIT has a whole section of its university dedicated to the study of gamification. And, and part of that uh, education arcade says that game players regularly exhibit persistence, risk uh, taking attention to detail, and problem solving. All behaviors regularly demonstrated in school. And that's where a lot of this idea of gamification and education came from. The idea that while people are playing games, their brains are acting the way we want them to be acting while they're in class. We want them to be engaged. We want them to be thinking about these things. Look, there's a gamification summit every year. Where, and this has only been going on for three or four years. Where all this latest research from all these universities get together and they talk about the latest, the latest studies. But it's so easy, guys. At, at, at sometimes this concept is very difficult to grasp because it seems like it's very out there. But it's very simple. Look, anytime you attach a measurement to something, you're making it into a game. It really is that simple, okay? Take something like the appointment dynamic. We all talked about the appointment dynamic after, okay? Appointment dynamic is the most popular game that each and every one of you, well, 95% of you, play on a regular basis. And it's probably the most popular game in America about 5 p.m. on Fridays. Why? Happy hour. Happy hour is a game. It's a very simple game. Again, between five and seven, you can get three drinks for the price of one. So it's a very simple, the rules of the game are very simple. You show up, you buy a drink, you win. You show up at 4.30, you show up at 7.30, you lose, you don't get the reward, you don't win the game. Okay, it plays to the very nature of human psychology. These are all game dynamics that we're talking about now. Look at something like blissful productivity. The idea that you are happy working. The average World of Warcraft player spends 22 hours per week playing the game. World of Warcraft is a game in which you have to complete quests to get better equipment and gold that you can use to buy new swords and stuff. So you could buy, go fight bigger things and get their stuff to then go and buy more stuff to go buy, fight bigger things and buy more stuff and go fight bigger things and you basically continue doing that over and over and over again. It's a part-time job. At 22 hours a week, it's a very lucrative part-time job. I came upon this app the other day. I wanted, I wanted to, uh, I used to run a lot. Obviously, I don't anymore. I used to run a lot and I found this, uh, this game when I was browsing uh, on my phone, it's called Zombie Run. And I thought, oh, what is this? And it's basically a game. It's an audio game. You turn on the app when you go running, right? And as you start running, it starts telling you a story about a zombie apocalypse. Zombies are loose. They're now after you. You better run faster or they're gonna eat you. Okay, and it's meant to be humorous and it's meant to be fun. And at the end of every run, the GPS tracks where you ran and gives you points which you can buy to buy better zombie slaying equipment. It is silly, it is ridiculous, but it got me to run. And it got me to run faster. I didn't want to get eaten by the zombies. Achievement. The idea that in the virtual world, you can achieve something that you may not be able to achieve in the real world. Okay, and that's attached to things like badges, okay? Every app, every website now has these badges. Look, I was walking through the strip two nights ago, okay? And I look up at one of the billboards and one of the casinos was talking about how you need to check in at the casino on Foursquare so that you can win the casino badge. Okay, this is Las Vegas in the middle of the strip at eight o'clock at night Right, on a very uh, on a long weekend. And that's what they're broadcasting, is you can win a digital badge. 
so that you can show it to your friends on Facebook. There's no value to it other than having the badge. Communal discovery, the idea that as a group of people we can discover something. Right? The entire community can get together to try to figure out a problem. This is something that we're going to be coming back to a little bit later today. Status, rank, level. Why do people go to the same Starbucks? The same Starbucks, not Starbucks, but the same Starbucks over and over to check in a four score. Why do they want to be the mayor? Why do they want to be the rare? They want the status. They want to be able to say, I'm the mayor of this Starbucks. It's my Starbucks. Here's my flag. Gamification is a powerful marketing and business tool that is reshaping our world and has been reshaping it for the last several years. Okay? There's been countless, countless presentations and studies done about the fact that there's a new game layer developing over the entire world where everything in your life is being gamified. So how do we apply this to education? It's a good question. This is Lee Sheldon from Indiana University. He's in the Department of Telecommunications. He did something really interesting in his class. He turned his entire class into a game. He said every student starts off with zero points, level one and an F. And every assignment, every test, every quiz, every homework is worth a certain amount of points. And how you scored on it gave you experience points. And as you gained experience points, you would go up in level. And as you'd go up in level, so would your grades. And what he found was just simply changing the parameters of how the game of school was played. He had kids that were doing more homework and better work and getting better grades overall. <clears throat> he said, as the gamer generation moves into the mainstream workforce, they are willing and, and eager to apply the culture and learning techni techniques they bring with them from games. It'll be up to management often of the pre-gamer generation, which is kind of the problem we have here in this disconnect, to figure out how to educate themselves to the gamer culture and how to, how to, to speak to it effectively. Uh, the Florida Interactive uh, Entertainment Academy, I had a buddy of mine who graduated from this school. Uh, it was a school that's built uh, with the University of Central Florida. Uh, they were given a, a grant by uh, Electronic Arts, which is a large uh, game manufacturer located in Orlando. They gave them uh, six or seven million dollars to build this school. And they had this great uh, program, a two years master's program for game design. And it's interesting how they've gamified even the game design courses. The seniors, the, the, the guys that are getting ready to graduate have to do a senior project. And the way they do it is that they break them up into groups. And part of the, the project is basically you have to develop a fully functional video game. Okay? And in and of itself, that should be enough. The fact that you need this to graduate, that it's a grade, but it's not. What they then do is say, hey, we're going to take those games and we're going to release it to the public for free on the website. And to this day, you can go and look at all their graduating classes video games and you can download them and you can play them. And what I found interesting was when I toured the school, when I was meeting with some of the students, all they kept talking about was how they were going to produce the best game that year, how they were going to get the most downloads when it was released. It wasn't about the grades. It wasn't about graduation. It was about their status. It was they wanted to be the best. They weren't motivated by any of the things that the school traditionally used to motivate them. They were motivated by the idea that they themselves wanted to produce the best game. This is my uh, daughter Ella again, for those, those of you who didn't meet her yesterday. She, she taught us a lot about volcanoes. Um, she, had to, she has to do this thing called Ticket to Read, and there's another, uh, there's another online program she has to do. And uh, I just wanted to share this really quick story with you about it. Um, the first time she had to do this, she's in an advanced school program. She's uh, in one of those gifted programs. And they made the students do this three or four times a week, where they have to go home and do like an hour of online school you know, through these programs. And she didn't, I mean, she fought me tooth and nail the first time she had to do it. She, she, was, she was whining, she didn't want to do it. She was complaining, this takes too long, this is boring, this is that and everything. Until the end. Because at the end, all of a sudden, a bar appeared and it started to fill up. And it said, hey, you need 750 more points to level two. And she looked at me and she goes, what's level two? And I said, I don't know. I've never used this. And she goes, 
but I want to know what's level two. Can, can I do this again? I, I don't know, I mean, try to do it again. So she played it again, and she played it again. She was on the thing for two and a half hours. Then she comes screaming into her room, I reached level two. And she was ecstatic. And I was like, okay, what did you get for level two? Oh, I got a, I, I got a little thing that says I reached level two. I'm gonna go try to reach level three now. And we're like, no, 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 you, you gotta go to bed. And she's like, no, 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 I have to reach level three. If I don't reach level three, you don't understand what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen? I'm gonna be level two. I remember three or four years ago when this happened, I thought to myself, if someone can figure out a way to sell that, they're gonna be millionaires. And when I thought about it some more, I realized they gamified this entire thing. They added two different game dynamics we just talked about to it. The first is progress. The idea that I'm progressing towards a new goal. The second is status, the idea of level. Because you know what the teacher did? The teacher, who was very brilliant, put up a list of what everyone's level was in the classroom. And so then it became a competition of who was gonna be the highest level. The teacher didn't say a word about it. The teacher didn't say I'm gonna give a prize to who the highest level is. She didn't even encourage them to compete against each other. It was just a natural human psychology. Khan Academy is an online university that basically is free. You know, he, he has thousands of classes. It gets about, it's gotten about, uh, I think it's over 80 million users at this point. Uh, and he creates these short 15, 20 minute classes to let people use it. And it gets used a lot in schools to teach lessons and by parents who want to help their kids study for math and science and all these different things. He added a badge system now. And ever since he added the badge system, you started to see more and more and more people doing it. Not just the kids are doing these classes, now, now the parents are doing the classes. Why? Because they want the badges too. Because the badges are cool and I need them. I need them a lot. I don't feel complete without them. University of Rochester did a study, a five-year study, in which they studied action, violent action video games, things like Halo and Call of Duty. Because they want to see what kind of a psychological effect it has on kids. And the results kind of stunned the scientific world. Because it's thrown for a loop everything that we understood about video games. See, we always thought that violent video games led to violent people, led to violent students, you know, led, led, led to people who were maladjusted. And, and not only did the study not show that, it showed that it had absolutely no effect on a person's psychology, but it had a very positive effect. It found that the average player of these games okay, could pay attention to five or more things happening simultaneously. Because when you're in a war zone and they're shooting at you from rooftops and around the corner and grenades are being thrown at you and your buddy just got shot and you gotta pull them out, you gotta be paying attention to all these things or else you're gonna lose the game and people are gonna mock you. The average person can only pay attention to four things simultaneously. And so what they found is that it allowed the, 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 the gamer, the, the user of the game, to be able to expand their ability to think about multiple things at the same time. Now, this kind of falls in line with what the Department of the Navy Science and Technology Center, Research Center was doing. They did a massive study on video game use and its, and its application in military use. And what they found was that video game players had 20 to, 10 to 20% uh, higher in terms of perceptual and cognitive abilities than normal people they were able to think better and faster by about 10 to 20 percent than the average non there's a reason why the US Army is using video games not only to recruit soldiers but to train soldiers the army has just invested 50 million dollars over five years to develop simulation simulation games to train soldiers for combat zones they found that using video games to train the soldiers allows them to, again, think of more things at once and to adapt to situations much quicker, uh, situations that they could not anticipate, than other non-gamers. This is what's called fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is ex exactly what it sounds like. It's the ability to think about things in a fluid way. When you're playing a video game, 
you anticipate the unexpected. You know something's going to happen. It's the nature of the game. So you learn to adapt very quickly. You learn that when something occurs, you're able to make a quick decision, make an evaluation of everything, observe, make a quick decision, and take action. That's what you want out of your soldiers. That's what the military realized. That's why they've put so much money into the study of this. There was a great study done by um, uh, Professor Linda Jackson from Michigan State, who was a Michigan State psychologist. And she, she found that 12-year-olds who play video games are more creative than kids who don't. They have the ability to think outside the box. Again, the idea of fluid intelligence. This is, um, I want to talk about this study a little bit. Uh, this is Richard Landers. Uh, he's an industrial and organizational uh, psychologist uh, at Old Dominion University. And he did a study with a series of 400 students. And this is what he did. He took the 400 students and he said, look, I'm going to give you guys I'm going to put online on the social, on social media site all these practice quizzes, OK? You will not get any points in the class or any benefit in our class to do it, OK? But they're there. No one used them. They didn't want to go through the work of doing extra homework. So it wasn't used. Then he implemented a system where the students would get badges, digital badges, for completing these assignments. And what he found was that 28% of the 400 students were voluntarily taking multiple extra homework quizzes just to get the badges. Now, 28% may not sound like a lot, but it's a humongous amount when you consider the alternative was zero. All because it was made into a game. When interviewed, the students said, oh, the quizzes, the homework, it was fun. It was enjoyable. It was rewarding. How many of your students say this about your homework? It wasn't about the grade. That's not what motivated them. Because the average student's not motivated by that. We see it. We see it every day in the classroom. We see it every day in all of our studies. It was about the badges. It was about getting this little digital one kilobyte piece of data that exists nowhere but the digital world. 30%, guys, 30% of what you're talking about here. This is, a, uh, this is a video of an app that we are developing in uh, our education devel uh, department. Uh, you guys are seeing it before most people. Uh, this is an oxy fuel torch. It ha people have the ability to play around, change the flow rates. It changes the temperature, which is hard to see up here, uh, which changes the flame characteristics. People can then weld with it on their smartphones. Okay, uh, we're, we're, we're making this into a game now where there's a point system. We're going to add in uh, different types of welding, MIG, TIG, stick. Uh, there's going to be different elements of the game. You know, you got to keep your, X, your, your Y and your Z axis correct. You get points for all of it. You can share the points with your, uh, with your friends on Facebook. Um, it's a great little teaching tool. You know, it shows the welding process little by little. We've tried to make it as authentic as possible. Uh, this is still very rough. We're still working on the animations. We're still working on the, uh, on the game elements of it. But the whole purpose of us making it into a game is we wanted to engage both welding students and people who are just interested in welding and people who just want to play games. Last thing I want to talk about real quick is crowdsourcing. Um, how many people have heard of crowdsourcing? In many ways, it's a game itself. Crowdsourcing is the idea of outsourcing a task to a group of people. Usually it's done for free. Or usually it's done with some sort of promise of a reward at the end. Okay? The idea is I'm going to take a puzzle, a problem, something that we can't solve, and we're going to put it out to a group of random people and allow them as a crowd, as a group, to solve the problem. Okay? The most the most popular of these crowdsourcings, and really one of the things that started this movement, was the concept of the X Prizes. How many people have heard of the X Prizes? Okay, the X Prizes, for those of you who don't know what it is, is basically a contest. The most popular one is the, is the, uh, the manned space flight. The X, the, X, uh, the, uh, the X Prize Foundation put out a $10 million reward for any company who could put a man in outer space. 
It's that simple. Any company who could build a spacecraft that could take a man to outer space can claim the $10 million reward. And there's all sorts of different rewards. There's a reward now to build a better, more, more, more energy efficient electric engine. You know, there's all these different awards, and the idea is we're crowdsourcing this. We have a problem we need to solve. Government's not going to solve it. So what do we do? We put it out to the people. And it's not just huge corporations that are winning these prizes. It's small groups of people who are working together to figure it out. And this is being done with all sorts of things. Look, there was a contest recently called Dub the Dew. Mountain Dew sales were slagging significantly. They needed some sort of a marketing campaign to help boost it up. They wanted to rename the product. So you know what they did? They crowdsourced it. They made a contest out of it. They said, hey, submit a name on what Mountain Dew should be called now, and we'll let people vote on it. And whichever name gets voted the highest wins. They had to prematurely shut down this, uh, this contest. Anyone knows why? It's because. Um, People thought it was kind of funny and decided to mess with them. And the number one name voted on was Hitler did nothing wrong. And the whole idea there was crowdsourcing kind of backfired on them. So it's not a perfect avenue. And I wanted to share that because it's true. It's the reality of it. Crowdsourcing is not perfect. But crowdsourcing in many ways is pushing scientific innovation in this country faster than government and private agencies are doing it today. It all builds around the concept that we talked about of communal discovery. The idea that we're giving a problem to the group. We're giving the group the ability to discover something together as a group. It's no different than saying to your class of welding students, hey, we're going to build a race car. We're going to go race it. That's our goal for the end of the year. Let's figure out how to do it. Crowdsourcing can exist at all sorts of different levels. You know, it could be as simple as, as, as class discussion. Let's figure out this problem together. Instead of me telling you what the solution is, let's see if we can figure it out. Or problem-based learning, saying, hey, we're going to build this thing. We're going to solve this problem. Let's figure out how to do it. Or brainstorming, just simply sharing the ideas without having even to do it. Look, Things have changed drastically and are changing drastically and are going to be changing drastically over 10 years. This is a picture of what the internet looked like 20 years ago and what it looks like today. Okay? FTPs made up 57% of internet usage 20 years ago. FTP is a fly, uh, file transfer protocol. So it's sharing information, actual files. Okay? Today, video makes up a majority of the internet usage. Technology has shifted completely in the last 20 years. And that's helped rewire students' brains in how people think about things, how they share ideas. The world has changed completely in the last 10 years. And it's going to change again in the next 10. Education has remained relatively the same. So these are not concepts that are easy to use. They're not concepts that are you know, tailored so you could just turn key and walk into your classroom and put them in. But I wanted to share this idea to you because I, I truly believe fundamentally that if kids can't learn the way we're teaching, then maybe we need to teach them in the way they learn. And that that's going to solve a lot of the issues that you see coming out of this group throughout these presentations. Thank you very much, everyone.